It's one of the privileges of a university lecturer to study another subject without paying any fees. In the early 1970s, when I was lecturing at the University of the Vatersrand, I used this privilege to study biology. I was a serious campaigning atheist at the time and loved the fact that evolution played a large part in the course. We learnt about the evolution of the horse through Eohippus, through Mesohippus and other stages until we got to our own horse, Equus. We learned about ape men, the evolution of the mammalian ear and vestigial organs. In man, there were about a hundred vestigial organs and of special interest, the coccyx, which was the vestigial remains of the tail we had when men were monkeys. And the whale had vestigial organs too, like the vestige of a pelvis from when it was a land-dwelling mammal. As a whale, it doesn't need a pelvis anymore, so it's just a remnant no longer attached to the spinal cord. But most impressive by far were the drawings of Ernst Haeckel's observations of embryos as seen through his microscope. You can see evolution before your very eyes, from fish through turtle, chicken, pig, cow, dog to man, the embryos all start off just the same. They all have gill slits showing they evolved from fish, and they gradually differentiate into the final creatures later in the embryonic development. Who could doubt evolution with this evidence? I didn't. And, of course, as an atheist, I didn't want to doubt it. But then I found out that the evolution of the horse story had been abandoned as false 20 years before I was taught it at Witz. The prescribed textbook told the story, the lecturers told the story, yet the original display in the American Museum of Natural History had been relegated to the basement out of public view. And in 1954, Professor Heribert Nelson wrote, The evolution of the horse is put together from non-equivalent parts and cannot be an evolutionary series. Nearly 20 years before the lecturer and the prescribed textbook taught it to me as an established evolutionary fact. I then discovered that all of the roughly hundred vestigial organs of the human body were not vestigial at all. They had all been found to have essential functions. And the coccyx turns out to be not a vestigial tail, but a vital attachment point for essential muscles, including the muscles which control bowel movements. Without your coccyx, you'd probably need a cholestomy bag, and I'm absolutely sure you would rather have a coccyx any day. And the whale's vestigial pelvis turns out to be another essential attachment for vital muscles. Not only the muscles controlling the whale's bowels, but also the muscles which enable the whale to give birth to the young. The whole story of vestigial organs turns out to be a mistake, or wishful thinking, or a fraud. But the biggest shock came with Hackle's embryo drawings. Nowadays, you don't have to draw what you see under the microscope. You have a camera which gives clear and accurate photographs. When you look at photographs of the embryos, it's immediately obvious that they look nothing like Hackle's drawings. There's not a trace of gill slips, not even in the fish embryo. When you've put photographs of the embryos next to Hackle's drawings, they certainly do not cry out evolution. They cry out fraud. I discovered that Hackle's drawings had been called out as fraudulent by colleagues at his own university shortly after he published them. He was called before the Senate and admitted that they were fraudulent. And that was nearly a hundred years before we taught it as a valid demonstration of evolution. 
In fact, I discovered that every single example of evolution we were taught had been soundly disproved. But what I find really disturbing is the fact that these soundly debunked stories, which were taught to me 50 years ago, are in today's grade 7 textbooks, still being taught as if they were valid demonstrations of evolution. I was invited to visit the Evolution Museum in the Netherlands a few years ago. I walked into a lovely big foyer with an ocean of prebiotic soup surrounded by volcanoes and flashes of lightning and a display board explaining how life arose long, long ago. I went to the director of the museum and asked him why he was displaying this totally disproved story about prebiotic soup. His answer explains why all of the debunked stories are still being told. He simply said, if we don't show them this, what can we show them? There is quite simply not one evolution story which is true. It's not surprising that when Colin Patterson gave a keynote address at a meeting of the American Museum of Natural History and asked the assembled group of evolution experts, can you tell me anything about evolution? Any one thing, any one thing that is true. Not one of the assembled top experts could tell him one single thing about evolution that was true. It explains why Richard Lewontin admitted that science today has to accept patent absurdities and just so stories. But are there stronger grounds? than the fact that all of evolution's just-so stories are false, to support we cram and singers claim that the impossibility of evolution is a fact of science, which biologists seem blind to. Well, let's look at that next time. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe and press the bell so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner and in the description below.